Thanks. So welcome everyone, wonderful practitioners out there. I'm Anne Catherine, co-founder of Nordic Labs and DNA Life. Of course, uh, yeah, we are dedicated to functional medicine, um, preventative treatments, uh, lifestyle challenges and treatments through that and so on. So last time we had the webinar, I announced the launch of the new VMS and now we have launched. We launched right after. And um, we did everything we could for several months up until the launch to make it a success. And apart from a few glitches here and there, I think we did quite well. And I hope you kind of agree. Um, you're welcome to do something like this if you don't. Um, and if nothing else, then we have tried to help out where we could. So um, I, it's holiday time now, um, but uh, we are already planning a few new features that will be launched uh, within probably like next week or next week again. Um, it's gonna be the function that's called create your own journal note templates. And uh, you will be able to create your own templates within your own profile um, so that you can put in, yeah, the template that you want to add. And then you can load that every time you have a um, patient where you want to use it uh, for. Um, we already use those in the Nordic clinics, but uh, we can't, uh, right now it's like a back end where we have to add the uh, template, but we are going to make it uh, possible so that you can make your own and, and, and edit and so on in it. So um, today it's about CSAP times two. Graham's gonna talk about the basics and the clinical application and uh, a case study as well. And I will, uh, do uh, questions and answers with Graham at the end of the talk. So please write down on, in, in the notes if you have questions or thoughts or things you want to bring up at, that I can bring up at the end. Um, and of course we are recording. So um, we will share the recording as soon as possible. Um, and then next meeting we have is on the 26th of August and it's gonna be intestinal permeability assay and IgG food intolerance tests. Um, so um, yeah, stay tuned for that. And if nothing else, then stay tuned for the recording. So sign up so that you do get the recording. But now in the new VMS, um, you don't need to worry about <laughs> missing out because we have this feature um, where you can go in and see all these webinars um, yeah, when, when you feel like it. So um, yeah, you can do it both on your mobile phone and you can uh, do it on your computer. So enough from me, I'm gonna pass on all the uh, learning, exciting things about CSAP times two, the first tool test that I ever worked with for sure. So, but Graham, you've got the stage now and I'm gonna take over. Uh, yeah. people. Thank you very much, and Catherine. Well, welcome everyone. Hope you're having a nice summer's day where wherever you are. There's some bright camera pictures. Kaiser there is nodding away. Um, so yeah, of course, everything today is all regarding CSAP. I'm just going to start sharing my my screen here. Okay. Um, we can do that. Does this look okay, Anne Catherine? Yeah. Okay, so so goal of the session today, why uh, why is CSAP uh, testing helpful and under what circumstances? Basic result interpretation treatment strategy options and of course some case study examples and we'll, we'll follow with some Q&A. So of course in regards to um, the CSAP when to consider a test I mean some of these will be very obvious but um, IBS, maybe acute bowel issues, uh, Crohn's, colitis, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, because of how autoimmune diseases are connected to the microbiota and the GI tract. Then we have things like skin conditions, neurological diseases, et cetera, et cetera here. I mean, the list, as we've talked about a lot before, the list really does go on in regards to why 
we we should and could consider testing the, the, the microbiome to optimize our patient outcomes. So lots of reasons why we want we might want to do uh, some kind of stool analysis. I mean, as Anne Catherine said, um, you know, same for me, really, the CSAP was was kind of my, my first test to use really extensively clinically um, and still use it semi-regularly. Um, so today we're going to go through you know, where it might be particularly helpful, some of the differences to some of the other tests. So, of course, um, with yeah, GI dysfunction, or GI symptoms, it's rarely just one thing. This is a slide I've used multiple times in this, this series, and we can have a slow course of events or scenarios that lead to symptoms, so sedentary lifestyle, Western diet, alcohol, etc. And then we can have a rapid course um, that, that leads to symptoms very quickly, like uh, nerve damage or food poisoning, antibiotic use, etc. There. So many different reasons why we we might get GI dysfunction. And of course, the, the whole variety of stool analysis tests help to or help you to understand and your client or patient, whatever you call them, um, what might need to be done to improve those symptoms and get to the, the root cause of the issue, which is a big focus, of course, of functional medicine. So here, just wanted to bring this slide up again um, because I've used this before, but we have you know, all these different symptoms on the left-hand side in black, which are, of course, problematic symptoms. But on the right-hand side, it's these ones in red here where you have to be more careful. So if you're not a medical doctor and the client comes to you, complains of one of these symptoms on the right hand side here in red and they've they've not already seen a doctor or gastroenterologist then um, I would definitely refer them back to their doctor doesn't mean you have to stop working with them you can still do your interventions you can still do your diet advice or whatever but they, they need to be further investigated for um for more serious issues like cancer for example because you you don't want to be you know doing your thing and it turns out actually they've got some kind of colon cancer as an example and it needs uh, of course some kind of medical intervention and treatment as well so always cover your back if you're if you're not a medical doctor you know really screen the patient thoroughly you know ask them about their bowel movements and habits and what in investigations they've had before uh, and make sure to write all of this down in your clinical notes so in regards to stool testing options, I mean, um, all of our GI tests, they approximately assess for the most common parasites, fungi, dysbiotic bacteria, beneficial bacteria, opportunistic bacteria, inflammation, gut immune function and digestive capability. So whatever stool analysis you, you pick, it, it is going to approximately cover all of those areas. Um, now, my general strategy for using stool analysis is if you're, especially if you're new to gastrointestinal analysis, then it's great to start with the CSAP times two or times three. Uh, generally, we're going to do a, a times two or times three test because certain parasites have life cycles that mean if you only run a one day test that you, you may actually miss, miss those. Um, now, of course, as technology is developing and where there's more DNA, you know, multiplex PCR coming into the, the different analyses, that, that helps to also cover that there as well. But not all parasites can be detected using DNA technology PCR. So um, one of the big benefits with the CSAP test is it uses a combination of different technologies that, that helps to use some of the best in regards to the PCR analysis and some of the best in regards to actual um, the, the culturomics or the, the parasitology itself, you know, looking through the microscope at the patient sample. So, um, so if you're quite new to stool testing, I would really advise the CSAP times two or three. It's a, it's a great test to, to run with. Um, it's a, still a great test, even if you're you know, a very advanced practitioner um, it gives treatment suggestions, it gives good commentary in the report, 
Um, but of course, as you're learning more about the different stool tests, it's, it's very good to learn the pros and cons of the different stool analysis that we have, because some will be better under certain circumstances. So really, in my opinion, the, the best practitioners, they look at the patient symptoms, they look at the history, and then they're picking the stool analysis that, that best suits what they're looking for. So in regards to the CSAP, where it might be the better option, um, if you suspect there's a bacterial yeast, a fungal or parasite infection that can't be detected with DNA technology. So like I said a bit earlier on, um, when we use PCR technology, there's only so many PCR probes that can pick up the most common types of infections. So when you're using PCR, it's basically you're, you're looking, for example, for blastocystis hominis. But if there's some more unusual liver fluke parasite, for example, even if that parasite is in that sample because the DNA probe doesn't look for or doesn't have that DNA being checked for, it won't pick it up in the test. So this is a really big benefit with the CSAP test because it uses a combination of this moldy tough technology it uses multiplex pcr and it uses culturomics parasitology as well so um so you've got these these different elements all coming in to really cover multiple basis to to see both common infections and more unusual infections now at the end of the report you get a targeted susceptibility option analysis so you can actually see if you've got a hit on a certain bacteria that's dysbiotic then it actually gives you a susceptibility report meaning it tells you what to treat that dysbiosis with so that's a, a massive benefit with this um, compared to for example using P just PCR technology um, to, to see what infections are present, because then you don't get this susceptibility report. So also the CSAP it has an extensive stool chemistries profile. So you get things like short chain fatty acid levels, um, which of course we're learning more about the importance of things like butyrate for um, the, um, the, the mucosa and for keeping pathogenic bacteria low and also signaling areas like the brain. Uh, then it's really great value for money. The CSAP has been around for a long time. It's um, one of the cheapest stool analysis tests. So it's a great option for, for those clients who maybe don't have the, um, yeah, the, the, the money available to go for something like a GI 360 um, so really this, this test is fantastic because you get a very thorough stool chemistries profile. You get a combination of different technologies to look for bacteria, yeast, fungi, and parasites. Um, and it's, it's, it's good value for money. So the only possible downsides with this, you don't get microbiome diversity, which you would do in the GI 360. So you, you're not getting that more extensive report where you can see those six main phyla and what the levels are like. Um, you don't get Colostrum difficile or Helicobacter pylori as standard on this test, and you don't get beta glucuronidase. So if you're work, working with women and you're especially interested in things like estrogen dominance and estrogen reabsorption, then um, this test might, might not be the, the, the best option in that way. So just to clarify here, so when you're picking a stool analysis, PCR is great. I mean, it's just asking the question, is it there? Whereas culture addresses the question of what is there? So if you're using a GI map test, for example, you're, it's just everything in the report, that's all it's looking for. So it's just addressing the question, is it there and at what level? Whereas with the CSAP, um, and especially with this moldy tough technology that's actually finding and identifying new species of yeast, for example, um, it's, it's really you know, spreading a much wider net looking for, you know, has a much broader scope of bacteria, yeast, fungi, especially, um, as well as parasites compared to the GI map, for example, just analyzes for, for much more. So that's a big advantage of this, this test. Now, of course, with 
GI symptoms, you have to think about a whole you know, wide range of, of different anatomy. You've got to think about the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach. Uh, we've got the small and large bowel, the rectum and anus, and then you've also got the liver, the gallbladder and the pancreas, and then all the other organs and glands and lifestyle environmental factors that can influence those. You know, for, for example, we, um, if they have hypothyroidism, then it's going to affect metabolism and the function of the digestive system as well. So as we often say at Nordic, don't expect to find the root cause all the time. Very rarely does that happen on, on one result. Um, so you, of course, may need to combine this, this analysis with other you know, maybe supplement interventions or lifestyle interventions or even other, other tests as well, like cyber breath tests. Now, if we get into first case study, because then we can go through some result in, uh, interpretation at the same time, as well as um, looking at uh, an active case. So this first case is 36 year old female, it's Hashimoto's disease. So we've got autoimmunity going on, affecting the, the thyroid gland, vitiligo as well, uh, polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome, have IBS and she's taking the vaccine 75 uh, MCGs per day and feels overall okay but would like help in particular with with IBS. So here um, we have the first part of the the report and on the left hand side you've got the expected or beneficial flora here in green. Now what I'm doing here is adding, going down and adding up all the, all the numbers. Um, and basically NG means no growth. That's the lowest possible, possible score. So we, we don't want to see that. Um, and a four plus is the highest possible score. So ideally we want a minimum of two plus on each of these beneficial flora. Uh, but of course, it would be great to have a four plus in, in each of these. So, I mean, as a general rule at the, at the clinic, we generally want to see ideally patients at least over a score of, uh, I mean, minimum of, of 12, but ideally closer to 20. Um, of course, if you can get higher than 20, then that's fantastic. So here I'm doing a, a just a very quick count. So you can see overall, this, this client is not too bad. So, I mean, it's really the enterococcus species that, that need um, helping a lot. Uh, so that, um, oh, what's happened here? Remind me later, sorry, I've lost. Not sure what's happened here. Just going to stop sharing for a minute to just try and where's my screen gone there we go now i have it back sorry about this try again okay so um can you see this again and catherine yeah, good. Um, wonders of technology. Uh, so, um, yeah, so on this side here, we want as many, yeah, three plus, four plus as possible. Um, when we see like no growth in Pterococcus, so one thing is that we have resveratrol, we know is quite good from the research in helping in Pterococcus to, to grow. So one of the interventions I would use in this example would be to use something like either a liposomal curcumin and resveratrol um, supplement, or I could use this one from Doctors Best as well, uh, because I want to try and help to encourage enterococcus growth. Now, in the middle here, we have what's called the commensal flora. So the, the commensal flora, it's always going to fluctuate. It's going to go up and down depending on the yeah the scenario 
in regards to what's going on with the client. So you know, what they've been exposed to, what they've been eating, what medication have they been taking, um, stress levels, fitness levels, have they been living in the city or on a farm? This is going to affect the, this commensal flora. But what I'm approximately doing here is, is looking at, okay, again, the different levels of these commensal growth and what types are they? Um, and that just came through more experience over time about saying, okay, we know that Citrobacter frundi is connected with autoimmunity. We know Klebsiella as well. You can even see Streptococcus oralis here. So um, mainly uh, uh, yeah, one of these Streptococcus family that is usually present in the oral cavity. So when seeing things like this, I'm asking questions about you know, dental history because I'm wondering why is it perhaps um, growing so well in the GI tract and culturing so well there. So we're going to ask, yeah, what's what's going on with your teeth? How's your, yeah, how often are you going to the dentist, the hygienist? Do you floss? All these kinds of questions. And then might use specific foods. So ginger and fenugreek can lower citrobacter, for example. Um, to, to help yeah, control more of the commensal flora. Um, and as we can see here, the dysbiotic flora, there's, there's nothing present in this, in this sample. So, um, so overall, I'm just doing a very you know, a, a rough look at the balance between the two. So obviously, first of all, I want the beneficial flora to be as strong as possible. I don't mind necessarily, I'm not very worried if there is a number of different commensal floras here, we, we might expect to see that. But of course we want these levels to, to generally be lower because once they get higher, then they can move into the dysbiotic section. Um, and that depends from bacteria to bacteria. So um, what happens is when, when this comes back, the, the result from the laboratory will, will indicate whether or not it's a, a dysbiotic bacteria that you, you really need to focus on lowering or, or not. Um, so I'm not, overall, things like this, I'm not getting too, too worried um, with this kind of commensal flora here, but I want to try and improve it. I want to try and lower things like Klebsiella and Citrobacter. I want to make the beneficial flora stronger in this, in this case. So then we get onto the, the, the next section and there was no yeast isolated here. So there's, there's nothing to, to really do in this part of the report. So that's good. Then this is, uh, this is new to the CSAP. It's now also included a multiplex PCR section. So we've got the viruses, pathogenic bacteria and parasites that can all be detected using DNA PCR technology it's now included in the, in the CSAP. So this is really fantastic. And if any of these are positive, you want to refer that back to the doctor or gastroenterologist to, to, to get appropriate treatment or management of that. But usually if these are positive, the patient will normally have very acute symptoms like diarrhea, for example. Um, so just again, be, be aware in this section of the report, you, you don't want to be you know, messing around too much with, with patients that are positive here, we, we need to get them the, the, right, the right medical care to, to resolve that. Now in the next section, we get more into the, the protozoan, parasites, nematodes, cestodes, trematodes, etc. Um, and we can see here, so there's blastocystis hominis present, um, many. So we've got red here, many. So this tells you how, how much of an aggressive infection it is or, or how large it is. And um, we know this patient has Hashimoto's and there's some you know, more research or recent research come out, which is showing that actually blastocystis hominis is um, associated with worsening outcomes of Hashimoto disease and is maybe thought to trigger it in some cases. So um, blastocystis is a bit of a controversial parasite. You have many different practitioners with many different opinions, some very much in the treatment camp. This it must be treated at all costs and some very much in that um, it doesn't actually cause any, any harm and actually can improve the diversity of the microbiome. 
So I think you, you've got to take it on a case by case basis. So um, on the top right here, I'm going to use protozoan treatment directly due to the connection of um, blastocystis and Hashimoto's. Um, now I might use something like GI Synergy, could use oregano oil or things like ADP. Um, if there are multiple species present, if there's other ones as well, um, then uh, you, you might have to go on and treat for a, a longer period of time. So usually from treating blastocystis hominis, I use between three and a five month treatment process. So typically three months of full dose of herbs and then two months maybe at half dose. Um, then uh, for any worm parasites, we normally just go straight for medication because it's normally very simple. It's often take, um, yeah, can take one pill to, to resolve that. So uh, normally if we're seeing any presence of yeah, ground worms, for example, then um, or, or tape worms, we're going to use medication. Um, so if, I mean, if you, if this patient didn't have Hashimoto's, um, but had GI symptoms, it might be that, okay, we may decide to treat the blastocystis, but usually I'm going to rule out other things like SIBO before blastocystis treatment. Um, uh, yeah, whereas yeah, many, many years ago, I used to really aggressively treat blastocystis. And for those experienced practitioners on the call, they'll probably have had the same issues that I've had where sometimes it, it can be treated and successfully lowered and, and other times it's yeah, extremely difficult. Um, and GI symptoms could be due to something else like SIBO, for example. Uh, so yeah, really think about the case, think about when the symptoms started, do you feel it's due to the blastocystis or is it more likely SIBO that you, you need to go on and look for? So there's no other things here. We've got no, no other yeast. There's no red blood cells, white blood cells, no muscle fibers, vegetable fibers. Now this is quite nice, shark at Leyden crystals. So sometimes we might have a negative parasite results section, but if shark at Leyden, Leyden crystals are present, then it could mean there is actually a hidden parasite. Um, that's so that's a really nice part of this this test so especially if I have patients that have, have done quite extensive travel obviously before the, the pandemic um, and we're, we're possibly looking for a more unusual gastrointestinal parasite or it's not showing up on the, the standard test then I might often do something like the CSAP that includes the, the shark at Leyden crystals as, as well um, so yeah, as I said, this patient, Hashimoto's, we've got thyroid issue. We know there's some, or there's some emerging research connecting blastocystis with that. So I'm going to want to try and treat that. And classically, I would use something like biostin or GI synergy or oregano oil, and may even rotate those around to see how that, how that works with, with some rotation as well. Now in the, the stool chemistries section, so we have elastase, fat stain and carbohydrate. So we're getting an, an overall view. And the closer the elastase is to 200 or below, then that's going to really um, give me, um, yeah, basically tell me to use digestive enzymes or not. So 276, there's no, uh, no like fat stain detected carbohydrates were negative so this isn't really suggesting to me that we need to supplement with uh, digestive enzymes in this case um, then inflammation here everything was nice and low we've got a good secretory or it's an okay secretory IgA result and then we have the, the short chain fatty acids so these are what produced when the, um, the, the microbiome or especially some of these beneficial strains of bacteria will produce when you feed them with fiber. And we were especially interested in butyrate, for example, um, because of its good effects in the GI tract and the brain. So overall here, we, we've not got a fantastic short chain fatty acid result. Um, so we could use butyric acid here from BioCare to, to help to improve that. 
And so when I'm, I'm looking at this, generally I'm, I'm triangulating. So I'm taking the beneficial bacteria on the, the first page that we looked at. And then I'm also looking at the, the pH and I'm looking at the short chain fatty acids. And that then helps me to make a decision about what, how much do we need to support the beneficial flora? So obviously at one extreme, you could have very low numbers in the beneficial flora section. We've got low short chain fatty acids, and then we, we could have a more alkaline pH. So this is, it's getting, it's getting up there. So in this one, the beneficial flora, it wasn't too bad, but there's some improvements that need to be made, but we've only got short chain fatty acids of 5.7. So it's low end of normal. We have 6.7 on the pH. So what, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm probably going to use butyric acid and I'm going to use inulin um, as well if the patient tolerates it, as well as potentially you know, prebiotics in, with food intake to try and actually boost, of course, these, you know, boost the beneficial bacteria, try and help to improve the short chain fatty acids, try to lower that pH a little because then it's going to be harder for pathogens to accumulate and thrive in the in the large intestine. So I think that's one of the really nice benefits with, with this test is you get you know, the culturomets of the bacteria. You can triangulate that with the short chain fatty acids with the with the pH and, and make a, a decision about what, what needs to be done. So if the, the beneficial bacteria, let's say it's not fantastic, but it's a score of total of 15, 16, but we've got really nice levels of short chain fatty acids, we've got a, you know, a, a pH that's lower in the range, then it might just be some general, you know, general support. It might not be a lot of active intervention. So I'm always looking at those, those three areas. And then said, so, you know, any elastase level gets closer to 200, um, then I would consider using digestive enzymes there for, for sure. Um, then also we've got the bottom here, so macroscopic appearance, color, and consistency um, as well. So that was the first case study, and that's really how the new report looks because the CSAP has just been updated. I'm going to show some other case studies here, which is so it's going to the report looks slightly different um, because it's just recently been updated. So um, yeah, don't 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 worry, it's the previous one that we've just gone through, that's now how it commonly looks. But this case study number two, it's a female, 32 years old, food allergies and intolerances, headaches and herpes outbreaks. So here we can see um, we, we've got a bit of a different scenario to the, the first, we've got much lower beneficial levels, so lactobacilli, bifidobacterium, and then we've got clostridium is a two, so generally 3, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So barely, this is just barely kind of scraping over the level that I would want it to be. We've got much lower commensal flora compared, compared to last time. Um, so of course, my, my, my first thing is, well, the beneficial flora is low. So I'm going to use things like, could use fructo oligosaccharides here, especially lactobacilli. Um, you can use something like lactobacillus plantarum. We've got inulin, resveratrol, Jerusalem artichoke. Um, so there's, there's lots of different options to improve that, as well as for the bifidobacterium. We've got glucomannan, we've got soy, inulin again. So in, in, inulin overall is a generally a very good and cheap and simple supplement intervention. Again, if the patient can tolerate it, if they don't tolerate inulin, then often I'm thinking about SIBO being uh, a, a possible problem as well. So that, that's one of the things I want to do here. And um, sometimes, I mean, I'm not always worried about treating someone if we have dysbiotic flora and low beneficial bacteria. I, I quite often will both treat that with the herbal susceptibility options and use um, yeah, prebiotics or support for the bene beneficial bacteria at the time. I won't necessarily always stage it out. So uh, I, I might try and use, for example, GI Synergy in the morning and then at lunchtime or evening, use some inulin at small amounts uh, every day. 
so then here, when we're, we're looking through the, the parasitology, but we're getting down to the, there's, there's nothing here, nothing detected. This was a three-day three day sample, um, but we can see there's, there's moderate, many yeast going on. So we know there's low beneficial flora. There's some, some microscopic yeast overgrowth. Um, so again, we're going to talk to them about their, their food, see what's, you know, do they have a lot of simple sugars, a lot of grain-based products. But then if you're if you're not using like nystatin because you're not, you're not a doctor or some other yeast intervention, then we, we often use either something like mega mycobalance or yeast aid from from Kirkman. And um, so they would be two that we would use in this 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 case study here. Um, you can see no giardia or cryptosporidium going on. So the so some of the first main interventions would be yeast treatment as well as beneficial bacterial support. And when we get into the, the stool chemistries here, we can see elastase is fine, but there's some intermediate results in the carbohydrates. So we're going to talk about basics like chewing food properly, sitting down, relaxing at meals, maybe using some lemon water or apple cider vinegar to help stimulate the cephalic response. But of course, while we're working on behavior, then we might use yeah, digestive enzymes. There's a number of different ones that I use, but at the moment, these are the two that I'm using most commonly with, with our patients at the clinic in, in Stockholm. Um, so to start them, start them with those. And then inflammation wise here, we can't see any, uh, any big issue here and the secretory IgA is, is also okay. And then much, much better short chain fatty acids here and much better pH um, compared to the, the, the last test, but the consistency was loose and watery. Um, so again, we, we don't necessarily have this full triangle of bad results with bad short chain fatty acids, a poor pH and low results. So we've got the the yeast, we've got the low beneficial flora, so work on them, support the, the, the breakdown of carbohydrates. And then, of course, I'm, I'm looking at behaviors and underlying factors as to, to, to why this, you know, why, why are they losing with immune tolerance? What are things like stress levels, like circadian rhythm? Um, and then, of course, when we get later on after the, the treatment, we're using things like um, some of the different like GI revive some of the the mucosal support if they can if they can tolerate it but first we want to try and boost that beneficial bacteria try and take that that yeast down into a much better position support the breakdown of carbohydrates and then see how symptoms are are developing then case study three was a 45 year old male he moved to countries and had a newborn child at the same time and had lost 10 kilograms in that, that process and was unable to, to gain it back. So his goal was wanting to, to basically increase 10 kilos again. He always had this constant hunger type feeling. So obviously a lot of stress at work, moving country, newborn child that wasn't sleeping, developed shingles as well. So we know that there's been viral reactivation going on. So the immune system's not, not working as it should do. There was no GI symptoms, but he had quite a lot of medical investigation. You know, red flags have been ruled out, of course, because we were worried about things like, could there be some underlying cancer? Um, but all of that had been thoroughly screened and decided that there was no risk there. So thought, well, maybe there's something going on in the GI tract that's actually affecting this, this scenario. So here we can see, compared to the other tests, much stronger beneficial flora going on here. So that's, that's really nice. We basically almost got a perfect score apart from this enterococcus that was, was three plus. Some commensal flora, uh, and this one, in this case, we've got a, a dysbiotic uh, bacteria here, enterobacter going on. Um, and then in the yeast culture, we can see plus four on geotrichum species, so quite a heavy fungal infection and few microscopic yeast. Then we could also see that the elastase was, was 201, so a bit you know, right on this kind of borderline of normal. 
Um, but no, no inflammation, a bit low secretory IgA. And then also when we come to the protozoan section, we, we've, got, um, we've got blastocystis and enteromoeba hartmanii uh, present. Uh, so again, we've got two, well, here we've got two protozoan parasite infections. We have an elastase that's not ideal. We have quite a, a very heavy geotrichum infection and dysbiotic bacteria as well. Um, so what, what I did in this case is I'm going to use the, you know, the sensitivity report. So anything with a high sensitivity um, is what we want to use or a prescriptive agent. If you're a doctor, then you can use one of these options here. Um, and then, of course, we've got so the enterobacter results here. We've got the geotrichum here. So really nice with this test. It's telling you what to what to use, what what's going to be successful here in the in the treatment. Um, and we came to this. So I used digestive enzymes, and we we used them for approximately six months. Now I used berberine and grapefruit seed because if we go back here. Well, berberine was very effective against geotrichum um, and grapefruit seed extract was very effective against this enterobacter cloacae complex. Um, so that was the supplement that I, I went for to, to, to help. We know that nystatin as well, there's a high sensitivity here, um, but started with berberine and grapefruit seed uh, combined product along with digestive en enzymes. And then at month three, we switched to nystatin. We did one month of treatment, so went on to the, the medication. And then we re repeated the test. Um, and I can show you here. So this was after we went through that berberine and grapefruit seed and one month of, of nystatin. You can see that geotrichum is down to a plus one. We've not had too much damage occurring to the to the beneficial flora. It's relatively okay, um, but that dysbiotic bacteria has has disappeared. Uh, we've still got the the blastocystis and the enteromoeba hartmanii still present. So again, this is what you'll you'll see clinically. It can be very difficult to eradicate protozoan parasites. Um, but the the good thing was that after we'd been through all this and I tried earlier to increase protein and calories, but it hadn't worked. But it was really after about this, um, this like th three to third to four month um, treatment process where I really started to gain the, some kilos back. And we managed in quite a short period of time to, to gain three kilos, but it, but it took many, many months of, of, of treating that, that, that large fungal overgrowth and dysbiotic bacteria to um to, to help this this patient out so when we we got these new re, new results back so yeah dysbiotic bacteria had gone we geotrichum wasn't fully fully disappeared but it was now more more normal so a plus one level is considered normal um so then we can see that vegetable fiber fibers moderate so i'm still going to continue with the digestive enzymes and um also, because of the, um, the, the yeast levels here, we, we might want to, I'm going to continue with that kind of treatment and then also consider further parasite treatment if he doesn't progress further over the next, the next two months, because of course we still have those, those protozoan parasites present. Um, but also you can see here the, the secretory IgA you know, after all that treatment was, was hugely reduced so also we need to consider, okay, what, what else to, to try and help this level of secretory IgA? Um, so possibly looking at things like clostrum or immunoglobulin, so something like immunogg to, to help this. But, but again, difficult patient, I mean, very stressful life, you know, the pandemic, moving countries, newborn babies. So we're really working, you know, working against a lot of, a lot of things here but um, at least the weight is starting to go in the right direction after that initial treatment. And uh, so that was um, the, 
well, a bit of basic re results interpretation, a bit of like how I use the, the information, how I kind of triangulate some, some different factors and what types of supplements and support we, we might use based on, based on those results. So I hope it was somewhat helpful in giving you some ideas about the, the CSAP test. It was, and the uh, mid-chat has been uh, warm while you've been talking. <laughs> Oh, that's... <laughs> and it's actually been really nice because uh, some of the questions even that patients are asking me when I go through a result came up. Um, one was like, uh, I'm going to phrase it as a patient. So like, why is it that my lactobacillus is low, but I'm taking probiotics with lactobacillus in it? What's the reason for that? How yeah. do you explain that to a patient and a patient at the same time? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it, it's quite well. Of course, when when probiotics were start first hitting the market, we thought that well, you can just supplement with probiotics, and it's basically going to allow for culturing of that probiotic in the GI tract, and and that's not been the case at all. Um, so even though you might be taking a probiotic with lactobacilli, for example. Um, or bifidobacterium, it, it doesn't mean that that's, that's going to culture and actually grow. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's still, I mean, as we all probably know, there's a lot, still much more research and we have a lot more questions than answers about the microbiome and why do some probiotics work in certain ways and some in others. Um, but it, it's more that everyone's microbiome is unique. It's like a fingerprint. And um, it, it might be that the main thing that's affecting that microbiome is it could be stress or it could be food or it could be poor sleep. It could be city living. So this is the, the difficult thing. Just taking a, like a, a, a probiotic supplement it is not going to reverse you know, a microbiome that's being damaged possibly by med medication, high levels of stress, poor sleep. I mean, a terrible fitness level, a Western diet. So, um, so of course that the probiotics can be helpful in reestablishing some factors, but they're only, that they're, you know, that they're a, a bit of a crutch or a bit of support whilst that's, you, you know, giving you time to work on how they eat and sleep and how fit they are and, um, and, and how much medication they take and all these other factors. So you, you can't, you, you know, I, in my opinion, you can't kind of, you can't out supplement a, a really bad lifestyle. So it, it, it may help, it may move things in the right direction and move the needles, you know, so to speak, uh, a bit the right way, but you, you've got to look at all the, the broader elements and lifestyle factors. And I think that moves on to another question in regards to uh, partially high, pa partially high to, to, to yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you use that in your IBS patients, and it's it's quite difficult to get hold of guagum in, in Europe. I think it's maybe off the list, or what's the? But no, it's, you it's, can. It's, it's, it's not. Yeah, uh, guagum is not. It's not. I mean, you can you can get it, but it's it's not as, as easy as some of the others. We don't so, have BMS for sure because no. we had it and then it went off, and we haven't been able to find a product that can replace it. So it's inulin and other prebiotic yeah. products, but then again, lifestyle and prebiotics. You may want to give a comment on that. Yeah, I mean we. I mean, we try it. Yeah. So of course, then after the, the, the main probiotic era, we got into then the, the prebiotics. And I think it's um, you know, the, the understanding is that the prebiotics are very important for, for growth of bacteria. But of course, different prebiotics will help. I mean, different strains of bacteria. But overall, inulin seems to be an option which supports many of the, the benefit, especially the the, the strong butyrate producers but then of course some patients can't tolerate whether it's guar gum or inulin or glucomannan or whatever because they have 
um, SIBO, for, for example, because you're obviously trying to get prebiotics through the small intestine to the, to the large intestine. Um, but you can't, you, you're going to struggle to do that if there's also, you know, they have dysbiosis in the large intestine with SIBO on top. So you're going to have to address the, the SIBO first and then, um, and then come to the large intestine support once you've got things like the SIBO addressed and the, mi the migrating motor complex working a bit more efficiently. Um, and then you have to generally start very low and slow um, and work it up gradually. Yeah. And then uh, one practitioner asked in regards to uh, oil of oregano and like sensitivity towards it and inflammation and so on. And I know that if I have a patient who's very sensitive, I may start using um, something like glutamine, zinc, carnosine, just like gently and slowly, maybe a little bit of a milder uh, antimicrobial than oil of oregano because it can be quite hard. Uh, there's some people who don't even, like at least if we use the ADP tablets, there's some of them who actually, I have had a few patients who, where the tablet came out whole when they went to the toilet and then maybe yeah. it's better using it as a capsule, but really the purpose with the ADP is to get the concentration up as high as possible in the colon. So sometimes with the ADP tablets, it's, it's less harsh up in the stomach area because because it doesn't dissolve as quickly as a capsule does. So maybe that's a better product of using. But then I also have patients who experience like more constipation if they use ADP. So really it's a question of like trying, but it's, but you for sure don't wanna like, uh, yeah, pour acid into the, to the injury going on in the stomach and the esophagus area. So, I mean, always like be gentle and use maybe healing compounds before adding something like oil of oregano that can be really like, it's very strong and, and, and powerful. Have you got comments, Graham? Yeah, I think, uh, you, I mean, it's really good, raised really good points there that, of course, when a lot, when we did a lot of training, it was all about this, you know, five or six R process. Um, and you, I mean, my experience is you, you might have to totally flip that on its head and, and take, you know, different, the different R's at different times. And it, a lot of, of course, uh, some of it is very scientific. We, we have the result. We know what we want to do. We know what it's susceptible to. But of course, then you've got the kind of clinical art part to this where you have to, you know, you're obviously trying to to get to, to do your treatment, but you, you can't necessarily go for the, maybe the oregano oil is the best thing for that, but the, the, yeah, the patient can't tolerate it and you're going to have to you know, work around it, use, use different parts first of all, and then maybe build up to some oregano oil much later on. And that could be, could be two months later, or it could be six, could be six months later. Um, of course, we're always working. I mean, our work is always very frustrating because we're always working with limited data. You're, you've never got all the answers. You've never got the whole view and the whole picture. So you have to be prepared to, um, to, 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 you know, to do a, a bit of trial and error um, as much as we would like to think that you know, the work that we do is very well informed and you know, scientific. I mean, some, some of it is a lot of clinical work is a bit of trial and error and you know, developing experience over time to recognize where you, oh yeah, this is a patient where I might have to go more with that mucosal support or lighter treatments first and then get into maybe the, the harder treatment a bit later once you've you've moved them on a bit further um but it, it it's hard i mean we we don't get it we don't get it right all the time and we have to backtrack and we have to sidestep quite quite regularly so that's yeah not not unusual don't don't be afraid to you know you, you've got to try something and you've got to try and move in it in the right way and don't don't be afraid to to, to change the plan if it's not working. I actually have in my journal note template, and I believe you have it as well, Graham, that start with one supplement at a time, start with the lowest dosage as possible and increase the dosage slowly over the day or over a couple of days. Do not introduce anything new if you still have had a reaction to something 
uh, that you like one of the previous supplements that you started up on, you might have to stop if you feel bad. And then because because this is like a it's a it's a partnership between the patient and me as a practitioner where I suggest ideals. I I I, I have a very like educated guesswork going on and I have results from the from the stool test or SIBO or and and IPA or and 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 it gives me hints as to how how like gives me hints as to understanding the patient better. So it's but it, but it's just so important that it's a partnership. Otherwise, you have the patient calling you next Monday saying, "Oh, I got Herxheimer or detox symptoms, and I feel awful. I feel like I have a flu or I have diarrhea or whatever." So it's very just very very important to get them to understand that this is the best we're doing. But really, they they are responsible for. For, for, for working with the supplements and getting like a feel of, of what they they like in, in regards to taking the supplement. Yeah. So um, who has some other thing? I'm just gonna read those through when you answer the next question because another funny one, I don't know if it's funny, but it's a bit of a conundrum I would perhaps say, is like uh, if you find positive yeast in GI map and negative in CSAP, uh, how can that even happen? Of course, um, at Nordic, uh, of course, you, first of all, is it, a, is it a true split sample? Was the GI map, map collected at the same time in the same stool test as the CSAP times two. So that now we're moving into more like, how do we validate the different stool tests? Um, so that's of course one thing. Another thing is that uh, sometimes it can lie in clusters. So there's a reason why at least with parasites that we collect three times because that's the golden standard. It can cluster in the stool. So we might take a lump of stool where there isn't really any yeast in, and then we might take a lump where it's in. So there's things like that. And then there is this question of, is there a perfect stool test? Does it, does it even exist? Um, and I know is the answer. And I know like, I, I, didn't, I didn't voluntarily terribly, uh, choose myself for the study that we did at Nordic some time ago, but you did Graham. <laughs> so you collected how many stool samples was it in one go? Uh, I don't 16 know. 16 or 24? It's, it's, or... it's a very bad idea. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, was, anyway, we were all like was, lined up on the bathroom floor. It was terrible. It wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> we did. We tried to do. Um, well, we managed to do it. Split samples on several patients where we co uh, compared. Um, I can't remember how many, but maybe like eight different uh, companies who offer stool tests. And uh, we came to the conclusion that there is no perfect stool test, um, but, um, but there is still some consistency in the results, um, but it's not black and white this. So I think I kind of answered uh, that question a little bit here. Do you have comments or was that? No, I mean, it's just, the microbiome it's always it's always changing i mean if you run opportunistic bacteria from yeah one day to the next i mean again depends on what's what's happened but it, it, it's uh you know this living ecosystem so it, it's always going to be slightly different you're you're only getting a snapshot of that moment in time exactly so then there's this really nice question also in regards to this inflammation in the throat and oil of oregano, which she just added, I don't know, what was the name, uh, Andrea. So um, it, if she's asking if she only sees these like inflamed throat type patients. And uh, I don't know, sometimes we don't choose our patients ourselves. They kind of choose us and they come like suddenly you just see a lot of one type and they all kind of have the same thing and then suddenly it moves into something else. So I don't see the, I don't see inflamed throat type symptoms that often. Um, but of course it goes with like reflux and, 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 and GERD and, and so on that where, where it goes in there. But I don't, I don't know if it's just uh, like the, uh, the magnetism in the <laughs> in the universe that uh, yeah I don't know do you Karen? Do you many of uh, I mean I think um, 
of course there's there's word of mouth and groups so generally if you've helped someone with a certain condition then they will often i mean you know a lot of patients now are in self-help groups and group sharing so then i think you get a lot of you know, if you've helped people with with certain issues then you you'll tend to accumulate more of them um because they talk uh so i think that 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 that's probably why that you, you will then get a lot of those people um, if you're not targeting them specifically with, with your marketing or, or whatever. But then uh, bone, I use a lot of bone bone broth uh, for, for like inf- you know, esophageal inflammation, um, colostrum, zinc, zinc carnosine. Or so, yeah, very like aloe vera juice, things like that. Mm slippery slippery elm tea or mar- marshmallow root nice soothing yeah supplements and uh yeah food medicine medicinal foods is the uh, bone broth of course um yeah last question came in but i think it's with the delta variant and the gastric impact in regards to diarrhea if we've tested any patients yet to see dominant changes I haven't had a one patient who's had a Delta variant yet. Um, and also I would say maybe some of you, again, it's this like who pay, what patients reaches out and so on. For sure in Denmark, um, functional medicine clinics, uh, not that there's that many of them, but the pattern I see is that it's still too early days for the long haulers to come to the clinics. They are still going to their own doctor they're still like trying out within the system and eventually I guess they start to look like on the, on the internet and try to see what what else can we find and then um, yeah so maybe in six months time or a year time but have you had any of those Graham that not that I know with the, the, the delta variant but I don't think in I'm not sure in Sweden if you're getting to know which which variant you you actually have but we we're, we're having a couple of, of long long haulers um and we're mainly looking yeah at the microbiome and viral reactivation um especially so uh yeah that that's where we're we're focused more in our in our analysis mm-hmm. um but uh yeah so we're seeing some with you know, diff, considerable dysbiosis and then some with with a lot of um, herpes virus reactivation. So e- EBV, CMV, exactly. herpes simplex one and two. It was, there was a study and now I'm referring to it in a really poor way, but uh, like that some of the long haulers that it was like, was it 65% of those actually had reactivated EBV? So yeah. um, that's for sure something to consider. Right, Christina is asking experience about Uber Ursi berberine for dysbiosis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never, I don't really, I've not really used a lot of Uber Ursi to be honest, um, because I mean, it's I, I, normally on the susceptibility report, I'd say. Um, I, I mean, I just have my favorite, my favorite tools. Uh, I mean, of course, if Uversi was the only one that it was susceptible to, and there was no medication that would work, then, then of course we would, I, I would use it. Um, but, but as you see, most often the results, there's normally two or three options like caprylic acid, berberine, oregano, uh, and I just all, always, I mean, it's like each practitioner. You know, we have our toolbox and we have tools that we've used for a long time and we stick with and we have tools that come in and out and change but Uberus is I know some of the practitioners have used it a lot and, and really you know, have, have good results with it but it's just never been a major tool of mine but it doesn't mean that I wouldn't use it it's just um, I would if there was berberine or caprylic acid or oregano I would I would use one of those over Uber Uber Ursi just because they're more accessible in, in Sweden, especially. And I would say ditto to that. And actually, Uva Ursi comes and goes. Uh, sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not. Then we need to find a new manufacturer. So it's one of those that's a little bit challenging as well. I know, because I use a CSAP times two a lot. Um, and I, it's, it's 
more or less always grapefruit seed extract that works. And then the second one is, is caprylic acid. Um, silver also comes up regularly um, and berberine. And then uva ursi, some, like again, I would use uva ursi if it's like the, la the one, like all the others don't work and it's uva ursi, that's the only like agent that can, that has antimicrobial effect also or high sensitivity. So I, I can only agree with that. Glutamine, if we use that as part of uh, the protocol, I for sure do, but I always use it together with uh, zinc carnosine in the product called Inducine. Um, then I give um, maybe two capsules uh, per day um, to the patient. Sometimes I can choose to add a little bit of glutamine, but I, I, I'm not a high dosage of, of glutamine, I think. Uh, two capsules of, of Indocene is, 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 is what I have seen over the years, is, is my go-to at the moment. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, glutamine usually, I mean, Anderson is a great product, actually. It's just great, great one to bring up. And Catherine, I haven't used that for a while. It's always great with these discussions. But then you're like, oh yes, that's a. Uh, I mean, I, I use a lot of. I've been um, using more, yeah, uh, G, GI Revive, but it, it can be difficult because it has a lot of different products in that. So some don't tolerate some of those products. But I've used a lot of GI Revive. Um, I've used the one by Microbiome Labs as well, Mega Mega Mucosa. Um, so I do do use yeah glutamine, but um, Again, it's one of many tools that can that can help. Uh, and it, I mean, try not to you know, rely on it. To I mean, if if high dose glutamine is needed to to um, yeah really really help the mucosa, then I mean, we've got to ask questions. Well, what what's going wrong? What what factors aren't being addressed? Um, and there's usually always an explanation like alcohol intake high stress, poor, poor fitness, Western diet, you know, high calories, high, high fat, you know, too, too much at certain meals. So, I mean, I use a lot of the, the IPA, the intestinal permeability and absorption to, to understand the permeability, especially in the, the, um, in the stomach and the, and the small intestine. Uh, and that's where, I mean, of course, if there's if there's much higher results on that test, then yeah, it may really dose, dose in some more some more glutamine to help. But of but of course, it's you know, it's it's not or it's not the, the root cause. It's not a lack of glutamine. It's you, you've got to you've got to use it to help, but but also get to the bottom of the the, the factors which have led to that that position happening. What causes the intestinal permeability? Uh, is more the question. It's probably not a always a lack of glutamine but more at this biotic uh, flora going on and yeah. uh, stress and cybo and uh, <laughs> other things that uh, causes it anyway people are beginning to say thank you there's been some really nice uh, messages to me directly uh, thanking us for doing these webinars and uh, yeah but i really enjoy it of course uh, the most of the work is with graham these days these days i'm just on don't know about ride. that <laughs> don't know about that yeah. so but have a lovely uh, month until we see each other again many of you will hopefully have summer holidays i know i am and i know graham will be we've actually cheated and started a little bit already so that's why i'm in my summer dress here <laughs> so thank you everyone and see you soon and don't forget to reach out if you have questions um, or ideas for the new VMS. We have this long list of things that we want to plan on and so on, but you may have good ideas as well. So just, yeah, let us know what you're thinking. Take care. Have a lovely summer. Bye. Bye.